Yes, that's that's how all New Yorkers sound to me. <laughs> Even the black ones, they all sound like that yeah. to me. Yeah. Well, thank you again for taking the time to talk with us tonight. Uh, really appreciate you and your work. Um, uh, your work for me kind of coincides with other people that I've read about this. I don't know if you've read uh, Rob Larson. Um, he definitely had some books on this. Um, weapons of math destruction that came out. Kathy O'Neill, very about good. four or five years ago. And yeah. someone I was actually on a show with a few years back, uh, Zazana Zuboff. I think that's how I say your name. Zuboff. Uh, sure. uh, we have, I wouldn't say we have beef, but we definitely have disagreements, me and Zuboff. You I got, think you, Zuboff did you guys have it out on air? Uh, no, I wrote a book about her book called How to Destroy <laughs> Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, basically about the idea that like, everyone who ever claimed to have built a mind control ray turned out to be full of shit whether that was like rasputin or mk ultra or pickup artists or nlp weirdos mm -hmm. and the fact that big tech claimed that they built a mind control ray to sell your nephew fidget spinners and then robert mercer stole it and made your uncle a QAnon racist mm -hmm. just like kind of it's it stretches credulity and like far be it for me to believe that these guys who are like visibly just ordinary mediocrities are in fact evil wizards who are hacking our dopamine loops, uh, especially when there's like much uh, more straightforward explanations like they have a monopoly. Right. And so mm -hmm. like, why do we use Facebook even though we hate Facebook? Well, maybe it's like the same reason we use smoke cigarettes, even though we don't like cigarettes, which is that we're addicted to them. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just because all of our friends are locked inside of Facebook and we like our friends more than we hate Facebook. Mm. That's just it's just like a, a much simpler explanation. I think a lot of people read Zuboff and think that the part that she hates about surveillance capitalism is just the surveillance is, is the capitalism. Mm -hmm. And she's actually quite loves the capitalism. She just hates the surveillance. Uh, and she like she thinks that the answer to all of this is we just make everything the iTunes store. And if you put a price tag on everything, it'd be fine because everyone knows if you're not paying for the product, you're the product, which is obviously untrue. Cause like nobody gives away John Deere tractors and yet farmers have to pay $180 <laughs> to have their own repair on their tractor well, kind of overseen by, by John Deere technician. I do want to get into that. Yeah. So you are jumping ahead. No I more know. caffeine for you, Corey. Uh, I, I got back from, I did a gig in, in Italy, uh, day before yesterday and I got back last night. So I have in fact drunk enough coffee to kill a rhino today. Otherwise it'd be <laughs> flat on my back. That is another reason why this was so hard to do. Cause you were flying and all this other stuff. We had to yeah. get it right. But what was the inspiration for, for you running to write this? Was it just the lockdown and what you were seeing during the lockdown? No, you know, I, I've been working on digital human rights for 20 years. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm now a special consultant to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I was their European director. I was their delegate to various standards bodies, the United Nations, uh, the Westminster Parliament, and and also the European Parliament. And, and I spent a long time trying to explain how all this stuff works to people, some of whom I think were acting in good faith and were, you know, fundamentally agreed with, in agreement with me about the importance of, of protecting human rights online and some of whom i think were just um bamboozling people and uh they tended to get quite confused uh and and particularly as um tech got bigger and bigger this kind of uh fracture appeared in the world of technological criticism and tech activism and on one side you have people who are like the problem with big tech is that it's still run by the wrong people uh, that, that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is, uh, monumentally unsuited to being the unelected social media czar for life of 4 billion people. But if we either like made him clean up his act or maybe fired him and replaced him with a better Mark Zuckerberg, that we would have a better internet. And, and I think that, uh, it's, it's the other side of this is that like, nobody should have that job that, that Mark Zuckerberg shouldn't exist. We should abolish Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and that, um, as convenient as it might be to say, oh, well, big tech has got all these problems, so big tech could be the solution. Like maybe we can um, deputize big tech platforms to identify all the people who do harassment or disinformation or whatever actual like real no fooling, real problem there is on their platform. Maybe we'll deputize them to fix them. And, uh, and because they're so big and they're so well resourced, they'll be able to do it. Whereas if we were to like shatter big tech into lots of, uh, you know, autonomous federated entities where where the people who use them 
uh, operated them or at least had the choice to go somewhere else because there was a big plurality of platforms, uh, that those platforms would be too small to keep the bad stuff from happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the abolish Zuck side of this. I, I want to get rid of, uh, these large platforms. I don't think there is like a stable configuration of platforms that support billions of users. Uh, I think that, um, not only are they prone to abusing us, but even when they're not prone to abusing us, the the small errors that we're all prone to become quite large problems when they affect billions of people. Did this get magnified for you during the uh, the shelter in place during 2020? Uh, I guess so. I mean, you know, if I want to be honest, like the biggest uh, crushing moment for me was... Uh, the European Copyright Directive of 2019. Um, and, and this was a, a proposal. Well, it was a big gnarly hairball of proposals as all European cop, uh, directives are. But one part of it was to require uh, internet filters or uh, copyright filters for all internet platforms. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that um, everything that you wanted to say or all the music you wanted to post or sound files or video or images would be run through these filters where... Uh, people could upload things that they claimed belonged to them, that they held the copyright to. And if it matched something in the database, you wouldn't be able to upload it. So something similar to YouTube, uh, YouTube's content ID, but like on steroids. Um, and uh, this was a terrible idea. And a bunch of people who were had real problems um, got tricked into thinking that this would solve those problems, that, that somehow, you know, the problems of artists getting ripped off by their employers or uh, news companies being uh, ripped off by payment processors and big tech. You know, the 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 two platforms take thirty cents out of every dollar that uh, news platform collects through an app, or being ripped off by ad tech platforms. You know, Facebook and Met and uh, Google rip off fifty one percent of every dollar spent on ads. So if you're ad supported media, more than half of the money that you should be getting is is disappearing into their pockets, and and these people just got led down the garden path, and we mobilized uh people in 50 cities to do large street demonstrations we had the largest petition in european history um it came down to a key vote um we lost that vote by five votes mm. and afterwards 10 swedish european members of parliament uh, members of the european parliament uh said that they got confused and pressed the wrong button and had their um their votes changed in the official record but the way that european uh, votes work is that even if the vote goes one way in the official record, if in the moment, the way the button presses add up, mm -hmm. uh, goes the other way, then that's how you go. And I just, it just broke me to have come so close. Mm. I think five votes. Oof. Yeah. Oof. Well, and, and that we won ultimately by five votes, but even so yeah. we lost, you know, it was, it was just crazy. I'm, I'm actually about to do a remote gig for, um, a bunch of Swedish policymakers, and I was talking to the people running it today uh, about what I was going to say to them. I was like, I am definitely going to call out those MEPs because I think they, uh, I think it was bullshit. I think they, uh, I think they had a bunch of corporate backers who wanted one thing, and they had constituents who wanted something else, and so they gave the corporate backers what they wanted, and then they had the shuck to convince their constituents that oh, they just like fat fingered the wrong button. I know that sounds conspiratorial, but. It, it it stretches credulity to think that these 10 people all just press the wrong button in that one vote. Well, uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit about interoperability. Yeah. Say, I keep saying it wrong. Interoperability. You... Let's just call it interop. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's worse because the thing that I'm specifically into mm -hmm. is uh, adversarial interoperability, which like terrible just just you say terrible. it in the book you're like this is a wank super wonk term but yeah. uh what is interoperability and why is tech what and why is tech doing to control it um what can we do as consumers to enable more interoperability inter, inter so yeah so interoperability like is either really simple or really complicated depending on how you think about it it's like what is is but um interop is is fundamentally the ability to make two things work together so like any light bulb will work in that light socket of yours you can put any clothes in your dryer uh wear anyone socks with the shoes that you've got on um you can uh open a microsoft word file in google docs and then save it and reopen it in iwork or libreoffice um, that's interoperability. 
And uh, interoperability uh, can be managed through formal standardization. So there are like groups of people who gather in rooms all around the world to argue about what like the screw thread on a light bulb should be so that every light bulb works in every light socket. Uh, it can be done um, after the fact, just um, on a kind of ad hoc basis. So mm -hmm. like every gas station has got a fishbowl full of 50 cent USB adapters for your car lighter receptacle. And like the people who designed that receptacle never intended for that to happen. Uh, the car manufacturer, at least until pretty recently, didn't do anything to facilitate it, but they also didn't do anything to block it. And then there's this other kind of adversary, uh, this other kind of interoperability, this adversarial interoperability. You think of it as like hacking. Uh, mm. It's uh, reverse engineering, scraping bots. Um, so it's things like uh, when Apple um, was about to be crushed by Microsoft in the early 2000s, because Microsoft wouldn't release a working version of Office for the Mac. So mm -hmm. you would like get files from your Windows using colleagues, but you couldn't open them on your Mac. Or if you could, and then you save them mm -hmm. again, they couldn't open them or the fonts would be all wrong or be corrupted. And the way that Steve Jobs fixed that was not by like begging Bill Gates to fix this crummy software. He just had some of Apple's staff reverse engineer the file formats for Microsoft Office. And they released uh, the iWork suite, which is pages, numbers, and Keynote, which can read and write um, Microsoft Office files, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And they just went ahead and did it. And that adversarial interoperability is something that is always latent in anything that's digital, because the only computer we know how to make, and, and this is getting into some computer science stuff here, but the only computer we know how to make is the Turing complete von Neumann machine, which is a lot of computer science jargon that just means a computer that can run every program we can write. So all the computers in your life, right? The, the singing greeting card, cheap microchip, the thing in your smart thermostat, uh, your phone, your laptop, they can all run all programs, some of them are more powerful than others. Like it might take, you know, some of those computers 10 million years to like boot up Photoshop, but give them enough time and enough storage and they can do it. And, and what that means is that you can always design modifications after the fact for computers that allow you to do things that the manufacturer didn't want, right? To run third-party ink or install apps of your choice on your iPhone or, um, you know, read your Word files with a program that Microsoft didn't make. Uh, or leave Facebook or Twitter, land somewhere else like Mastodon and still access the people and the messages and the communities and the customers that matter to you on those old services. And, and there's nothing that a tech company can do to prevent you from doing that technically. There will always be ways around whatever technical barriers they insert. But as you heard in that, in that excerpt you read, um, as the tech sector became more concentrated, as it turned into what Tom Eastman calls five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four, mm -hmm. we got to this point where um, it's basically illegal to do this stuff. Like Apple, when they did it, they that was progress. But when you do it to them, that's theft. And mm -hmm. they will nuke you until you glow. They'll bomb you until the rubble bounces. They'll say you violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, tortious interference with contract, patent, copyright, trademark, um, and, and you know, there'd be nothing left of you by the time there, by the time you were done. And, and so this is the juncture we've arrived at now where tech platforms have made it very hard for you to leave. Once you're on them, mm -hmm. they lock up your media, they lock up your friends, they lock up your files. Uh, and because they know you can't leave, they can abuse you without losing your business. And so they do not because they're saddest, but because it's a way of shifting some of the value from, from themselves, from you to themselves.